I do want to thank you for uh, being here today, being a part of worship with us, and uh, excited to see everybody, and uh, looking forward always each, uh, each Sunday to uh, our worship time together. Just a couple things to remind you of. Uh, during the month of, of March, the uh, offering for uh, North American Missions, uh, and there are some uh, offering envelopes back there in the back for that as you go out. Uh, during all this month, we uh, have an opportunity to receive that offering, so one just remind you uh, about that and uh, 20 days of prayer leading up to Easter we have a couple of more weeks uh, uh, before Easter there's still some of those prayer guides that are back there uh, for you and you can even uh, begin to jump in and join us if you haven't uh, already been doing that also today in the back when you leave uh, if you didn't get them as you came in there there are these little cards back there that say share hope and that's our that's our theme that's our emphasis for the year of 2021 is sharing hope, the hope of the gospel, the good news with others. And this is a Be My Guest card for Easter Sunday. So I hope you'll pick up some of those. And over the next couple of weeks, uh, when you see somebody that you'd love uh, to come be a part of us uh, on, on that Easter Sunday, I hope you just take these. Hey, would you just come join us at Olive Branch on April the 4th, Easter Sunday? So there's, there are several of those back there. Hope you'll pick up some of them as, uh, as you leave today and uh, share those with. With, uh, with some friends and those that you'd like to invite to uh, be a part of our Easter service uh, on April uh, the 4th. A couple of uh, prayer requests. Uh, Gerald had mentioned to me this morning as he was coming in, his brother-in-law, Sam Nobles, is, uh, is in serious condition in, in uh, Mobile Hospital, so especially remember uh, him and lift uh, them up in prayer. Uh, continue praying for Miss Jackie Skipper and uh, lifting her up and her needs there. Uh, Tisha Brown and her surgery, her shoulder uh, surgery, and she's, she's progressing along with that, has a good ways to go uh, in, in recovery and everything with it, so, but especially remember her uh, in prayer. And of course, I, I continue to be praying for the Conway family. I talked to Terry this week, and uh, so just especially remember them, continue to lift them up uh, to the Lord uh, in your prayers. In, any others that, that you want to mention before we, uh, before we have our, our scripture reading and then our time of prayer? Any others? Okay, if you would, uh, open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and I want to read verses 14 through 16. Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, and this is our scripture passage as well as the passage we'll be preaching from uh, in a few moments uh, today. But Romans chapter 1, verse 14 the Apostle Paul says these words, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. Would you bow together with me as we pray today? Heavenly Father, we do come today to first of all just thank you for the blessings, not only just of this day that already we have enjoyed, but of this past week. We also come today to thank you for answered prayer. Because, Lord, in this past week we saw evidences of how we had prayed for specific things and you answered those prayers, moved in the lives of people and in our own lives as well. And so, Father, we come today to lift up needs to you. And, Lord, I know even as I pray that there are names that will be called out that I won't call, but individuals in this room will call those names. And Father, you hear those prayers, you know those needs. Especially we pray for Sam Nobles today and the things that he's going through, the needs that he is dealing with, and you know what those are. Bless him and his family, surround them all, and provide for him as only you can. We thank you for Miss Jackie, and we pray for her, lift her up, continue to pray for her recovery and healing. 
for the direction of her life, we just pray for your Holy Spirit special touch in her life. And Father, we pray for T today and for her recovery from her surgery. We thank you for answering our prayer regarding that surgery. And now as her recovery process has begun, we pray that you'll continue to meet her needs, that you'll continue to give her strength, that you'll continue to help that shoulder heal in a proper way, that she'll return back to us and to her normal activities as she wants to do. And Father, we do lift up the Conway family to you today in prayer. And not only just that family that's grieving and dealing with grief, but the many others that are walking through that same process of grieving. And we pray for your comfort. You promised us that you would comfort us. You promised us that you would send us the great comforter, the Holy Spirit. And Lord, how I pray for that comfort to arrive in the lives of all those who grieve and who need that. And I ask that in a special way for those families. And Lord, I do come today to ask you to continue to guide us and direct us, to bless us as a church as we seek to reach out to our community. And Lord, Easter gives us a great opportunity to do that. A time when people have a tendency to want to go to church on that particular Sunday. It gives us a great opportunity to encourage and invite and I pray that you'll bless us as a people here at Olive Branch as we are focused in that direction. And so, Lord, over these next two weeks that we have, help us to be faithful and diligent in inviting people to come and join us on Easter Sunday morning. What a wonderful opportunity we have to uh, invite our friends and neighbors to come and be a part of worship that Sunday and to hear the wonderful news of what you did for us long ago that still affects people in the current time and present situations of life. And so, Father, again, we thank you for the privilege of being in your house today. Thank you for the privilege of gathering together in a family of faith. And Lord, we pray that you bless everyone that's come today. And may your word speak to all our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you will, uh, open your Bibles again to Romans chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at those verses that we read for our scripture reading a few moments ago, verses 14 uh, through 16. And I want to uh, bring the message from these verses today. Uh, we uh, are in a, a theme for the year of share hope. And the key word in that theme is share. There is hope. We know that. We just have to share that hope. So the key to the theme and even the key to the year and to the success of the year is our sharing the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a theme verse, and I haven't mentioned it in, in, in a few weeks, but that verse is 1 Peter 3, 15. So if you just jot that verse down and read it sometime, it, it just simply says but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give a defense or an answer for the hope that is in you to anyone who asks with meekness and fear. So that verse teaches us that we are to share with others. We're in a series of messages we started last Sunday that we have entitled, Pass the Gospel, Please. It's not past the peas, it's past the gospel. And the question that I want to raise today is why should we share? Why should we share? Why should we pass the gospel? Last week we learned what the gospel was. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 and 4 define the gospel for us. We discovered that the gospel is made up of three parts or particulars. Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And what we learned last week was is that the gospel simply means Christ died, a full payment for sin was offered. And not only did he die, he was buried, which means a free pardon from sin is offered. 
And then he rose again, which means a fantastic power over sin is made possible. That is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and what he did for us. So the question today is, why share that news? Why should we share? What's the motivation behind sharing the gospel, the good news? And that's what I want to talk to you about today from this particular passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. The Apostle Paul, as you study him, was a person of great passion. And so what I began to do is ask myself, what was it that, that fueled that passion? What was it that lit his fire for the things of God? And uh, we're going to discover what that was today as we look at these verses of Scripture and as we study our passage for today. You see, the thought that I want you to remember is this. The gospel is not fake news. Now that's a phrase that we've heard a lot lately in politics. Fake news. It's not real. The story isn't real. The gospel is not fake news. It's truth that changes lives permanently. That's the gospel. It's, the, it's a true story. It really did happen. Jesus really did live. And he really did die. And guess what? He really did rise from the grave. It's a true story. It's real. It's not fake. And it does change the lives of those who believe that story. And so that's, that ought to really be motivation enough, should it not, to share with our friends, our families, and our neighbors the wonderful news of what Jesus Christ did for us. As I studied this passage, and I've read these verses for many, many years now, I had never noticed in Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, three statements that are made. I read these verses, but I never noticed these statements. Three times in these verses, Paul says, I am. I want you to notice that. Three times he says, I am. If you will notice in verse number 14, Paul says, I am what? I'm debtor. You ought to circle that phrase in your Bible. Make a little notation there. It's an important part. Then in the next verse, in verse 15, Paul uses it again. He says, I am ready to preach the gospel. And then in verse 16, he uses it again when he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am debtor. I am ready. I am not ashamed. Now what I want to do this morning is I want to take those three phrases. I think they're important if he repeated them. And I want to take those three phrases and I want to share with you using those three phrases why we should share the gospel. Why we ought to do that. These three phrases tell us why Paul did it. They tell us the passion that he had for uh, sharing that story with his family, neighbors, and friends. And it tells us why we ought to as well. Number one, I want you to notice three things with me this morning. Let's look at the first verse and the first phrase where he says, I am debtor. I am debtor. The first reason that we should share, the first reason that we ought to give somebody a Be My Guest card, the first reason that we ought to try to invite our friends to church, but more importantly to Jesus, is this, a personal obligation. A personal obligation. Paul said, I am debtor in verse number 14. And of course, if somebody is a debtor, that means that they owe somebody something. I heard about a, a father who was talking to his son and his son was explaining to him that he was in the in crowd. And his father said to him, said, well, which in crowd are you in? The in trouble crowd, 
The in doubt crowd or the in debt crowd? Well, probably most of us are in the latter crowd. We're in the in debt crowd. If you're not there fit financially, I'm going to inform you that you are there spiritually if you are a child of God. You see, I want you to notice two things about this indebtedness that Paul is talking about. Two interesting things about it in verse number 14. A personal obligation. Paul shares, which is, here's the point, Paul shares the gospel because he felt a personal obligation. Now, this debt that he felt, first of all, I want you to notice that it's a spiritual debt. It's a spiritual debt. Notice, notice he says, I am debtor. And when you study that phrase, Paul is talking about the fact that the reason he shares the gospel is because the gospel came to him. And, and he accepted that gospel. He believed that gospel. And because he did, he feels a debt because of what Jesus Christ had done for him to share that with somebody else. Could I tell you that somebody came to me with the gospel? Somebody shared the gospel with me. And I feel a personal obligation to do the same thing with other people that are around me. I mean, I owe God so much this morning. I owe him so much. I owe Jesus so much. There is no way that I could stay up long enough and work hard enough to feel like I had done near enough for what Jesus Christ has done for me. And, and I think that ought to be the way all of us as believers feel. Has, has, has Jesus done anything for you? I mean, if he saved you this morning, he has done something for you. And you ought to just spend the rest of your life in personal awe over the fact that grace came to you and saved you where you were. Personal obligation. It was a, it was a spiritual debt. But I want you to also notice that this debt Paul talks about was not only spiritual, it was a special debt. Not only a spiritual debt. What he owed God for doing what God had done in his life. But it was a special debt. Notice what he says in verse 14. He says, I am debtor. And then notice the rest of the verse. I am debtor to the Greeks, to the barbarians, to the wise, to the unwise. Well, what does he mean? I am, I'm debtor to the Greeks. Paul was a Jew. So that would have been somebody outside of his Jewish culture. He said, I, I'm debtor to those folks. I'm debtor to the barbarians. If I could put it another way, maybe in our language today, he would say, I'm a, I have a debt to share the gospel with the up and outs and the down and outs. You do understand that there are some, they out both ways. They just up and outs and down and outs. The up and outs are more sophisticated sinners and the down and outs just don't care for you knowing that they are sinners, but they're both sinners and they're both headed to the same place and they both need the gospel. And Paul says, I feel an obligation to both crowds. And then he says to the wise and the unwise, to the smart and the not so smart, in basic layman's terms, what Paul is saying is, is that I feel a personal obligation to share the gospel with anybody and everybody because anybody and everybody needs to know the good news of Jesus Christ. So, it's personal obligation. Out of a personal obligation, you know, when uh, Queen Victoria was growing up, she was in line to be the next Queen of England. And they were tutoring her and instructing her in the younger years of her life. And her instructors were becoming very frustrated because she just wasn't interested in the instruction. She, you know, they were trying to teach her how to be prim and proper and all those things I guess English ladies need to know, especially if you're going to be the next queen of England. 
and she just wasn't, she wasn't getting it. She wasn't interested in it. She wasn't fully, you know, persuaded with it. And finally, one day, one of her instructors said to her, you, you don't understand why you need to do this, do you? She said, no, not really. She said, then you need to understand that you are going to become the next queen of England. And you know what Victoria said? For the first time, recognizing who she was and what she was about to become, she said, well, then I must change my ways. And could I say to you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, when you and I recognize who we are, a saved believer in Jesus Christ and what we've been called to do, I think we'll realize the personal obligation and responsibility we have to share with others the good news of Jesus Christ. So the first reason for why we should share is a personal obligation. We all are debtors to the Lord Jesus Christ for what he's done for us. Secondly, in verse number 15, Paul says, I am ready. This personal obligation had led to what I'm going to call a passionate overflow. His personal obligation of experience in the gospel, he had been saved. And God working in his life, he wanted to share that with others. It caused a passionate overflow in his life. Let me explain to you what I mean. When you look at verse 15, he says, So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome. Now the word ready is an interesting word. It's really a, it, it's, it's a Greek word which was the original language of the New Testament. And we, we from this Greek word, we get an English word thermometer from. So anytime it looks like I got a fever, my wife sticks a thermometer in my mouth to register whether or not there's temperature. Well, the word ready is a interesting word because Paul says, I'm ready to do what? To preach the gospel. So what he's saying is, is that there's, there's a passion, there's fire, there's heat in my life for one purpose. And that purpose is to talk to people about Jesus, to share the gospel with people so that they'll come to know Jesus. He had a, he had a passionate overflow coming out of his life to talk to people about Jesus. Now, now let me teach you three things about this passionate overflow. I want you to notice, first of all, that it was what I call a transforming overflow. It was transforming. Notice in verse 14 that Paul says, I'm ready to preach the what? The gospel. Now, you have to think about it in order to see the truth here. Before Paul met Jesus, was he excited about the gospel? He was not excited about the gospel. In fact, before Paul met Jesus, remember what he was doing? Acts chapter 9. He's trying to do away with the gospel. He's persecuting people who believe the gospel and he's doing everything he can to stop folks who are talking about the gospel. Well, let me just ask you a question. What in the world changed this man? What caused him to have a complete turnaround in his life and go from not wanting people to talk about the gospel, not wanting people to spread the gospel, and not wanting people to share the gospel to becoming one of the greatest gospel sharers the New Testament gives to us? What happened? He had a transforming experience in his life, which leads me to this point. If I don't really believe the gospel, guess what? I'm not going to share it. 
if I, if I don't believe it, I wouldn't be up here preaching it. But guess what? I do believe the gospel. I have experienced the gospel. I do know what the gospel does in a person's life. And that's why I'm passionate about the gospel. And until you let the gospel transform your life, you'll never have that desire or passion to want to see people experience the gospel. See, I'm still just old-fashioned enough to believe there really is a heaven and there really is a hell. See, we, we just don't hear that, that much anymore. I believe there really is a heaven. I believe there really is a hell. I believe sin is still sin and it still stinks to the high heavens and God won't ever overlook it. But I also believe there's a good news message and it's the gospel and you can be forgiven of your sin. Boy, that message is the message of the church. It just transforms a person's life. So, this readiness, this passionate overflow, it was a transforming overflow. Now, I like this next one. And I like this word, okay? I like certain words. I like this word. I, this probably might be an Owasa type word, maybe. I don't know. But, but here, here, here it is. This passion overflow, not only was it a transforming overflow, this is probably an H-E-B word, that's Herbert Ellis Brown. It was a teetotal overflow. You understand what teetotal is, don't you? It's just filled up and overflowing. Notice the phrase he uses in verse 15. So as much as is in me. Is that not a teetotal phrase? He says, as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel. In other words, Paul said, I'm filled up with the gospel and I'm overflowing with the gospel. And I don't know about you. But my wife will tell you, she will testify that it is the truth, good or bad. I usually, I, I, I am never into anything part of the way. Never. If I'm in it, I'm whole hog all the way in it. It's 100%. It's full bore. You could, you, you could probably tell that. Could you probably not tell that? Look, I don't know, I, I don't like to watch football if the team ain't 100% into what they're doing. I just don't care for it. I love football. But look, I don't, I don't like to watch it. it. You know, what is the purpose of saying, well, we'll throw that pass and try it, and if it works, fine, and if it don't work, fine. Are we going to go play the game, and if we win it, all right, and if we don't win it, all right. No, it ain't all right with me. A hundred percent. Look, I, I'm not even all right with much of what I see in the church today, which ain't a hundred percent. It's just playing around with God's business when we ought to be serious about it. We can give a hundred percent to something else. Let's give a hundred percent to God. Amen? Amen. He was teetotal in his overflow, excited about what he experienced. So it was a transforming overflow. It was a teetotal overflow. And watch this. It was a territorial overflow. Isn't that interesting? It was a territorial overflow. Notice what he says in verse 15. He says, so, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are, where? In Rome, a territory. Now, now you've got to understand this to really get the impact of that statement. Everywhere Paul went was gospel territory. You understand it? Everywhere you went was gospel territory. Really, that ought to be the church today, right? Everywhere we go, it ought to be gospel territory. Oh, but this is territory for the gospel. But now sometimes that's easy and sometimes it's not. Whenever Paul went to Jerusalem the religious center of the world and preached the gospel, you know what happened? They mobbed him. And when he went to Athens, the intellectual center of the world, you know what happened? They mocked him. And when he went to Rome, the power center of the world, you know what they did? They martyred him. 
So understand what he's saying when he says, hey, I, I, I want to come to Rome. I want to come to where you are because I have a message to preach. And he wasn't worried about the results or the consequences. He just wanted to get his message out. Whatever territory he was in, wherever he was, he wanted to share that good news message. So, why should we share? A personal obligation. That personal obligation will result in a passionate overflow that then will cause a powerful outcome. Notice verse number 16. His third statement where he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I, I love this phrase, of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Now that's an interesting statement because here's what he does. He forms this statement using a negative. I'm not. But he uses that negative to highlight the positive. Basically what Paul is saying, I'm proud of the gospel. The opposite of I'm not ashamed is, man, I'm proud of that. I stand on that, the gospel. And I want you to notice in these verses why Paul was so proud of the gospel. He was proud of three things when it came to the gospel. And we ought to be proud of these same three things. Number one, he was proud of the message of the gospel. Now, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Now, look at that word. Just pause on. We, we, we've been hearing that word a lot in just two weeks now. We know the word means good news. That is the word. Oftentimes in Bible type days, when a when a, a Roman general or a general of a particular country had been off to battle and had won a great victory, as he was preparing the triumphal entry back into the city, there would oftentimes be a herald. We would call him a newsboy today. And that herald would go ahead of the general on his return back to the city and he would gather the people in a common place and he would stand up and he would announce to the people that the army had won the victory, that they were victorious. And by the time that the general and his forces had made it to the city, the news had already been announced in the city. And there was excitement in the city. Hey, can I tell you that the church has the job of heralding the story that happened thousands of years ago when Jesus Christ came, died, was buried, and rose again. And guess what? One of these days, our general is going to come back. Man, we need to excite this world before the general returns for his church. Amen. That's the gospel. Paul was excited about the message of the gospel. But not only was he excited about the message of the gospel, he was also excited about the might of the gospel. Notice what he says in verse 16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the what? It's the power of God unto salvation. That word power is an interesting word. I mean, it's, the word it's, it's the word dunamis. Power. Tremendous power. I don't know if you remember this story or not. I remember it. October the 30th, 1961, the Russians detonated one of the largest nuclear bombs in a test site ever. You can, you can go online and research it out. They called it Tsar Bomba is what they called it. It had a code name, SV-220 or something like that. 
they, they, they detonated it out in the Russian Antarctic. They say in the research that I read that when they detonated that bomb that the, the, the pilots who dropped it, that they told them that you, you've got a 50% chance of dropping it and getting out of its range before it explodes. It was powerful. It, uh, when it was detonated, its, its cloud could be seen 620 miles away. That cloud rose to three times the height of Mount Everest, the highest spot on the earth. It had 3,800, listen to this, it had 3,800 times more power than the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. And it had 10 times the power of all of the conventional bombs that were dropped combined in World War II. It was unreal. And when I read that this week, I just pushed back from my study and I thought, yeah, man can build a bomb that can blow the hearts out of people. But only God could build a gospel that can blow the sin out of people and change their lives for all time and eternity. And that's the might of our gospel. I'm telling you, I, I know people today that, that alcoholism had them and the gospel broke the bonds of it. I know people that all kinds of addictions and the gospel broke the chains on it all and set them free. We got the best message and the greatest news in the world. The good news of the gospel. The might of the gospel. But he not only was excited about the message of the gospel and the might of the gospel, but the ministry of the gospel. Notice what he says. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto what? Salvation. There's the ministry of the gospel. There's why God sent the gospel. That's why Jesus died, buried, rose again. In order to make that payment for our sins so that you and I might experience the ministry of God's grace in our lives. I don't know about you, but I believe that every person faces difficulty with three things. Number one, the mistakes of the past. Number two, the failures of the present. And number three, the uncertainty of the future. Everybody deals with guilt, with grief and with gloom. I mean, you just deny it if you say you're not. I'm telling you, everybody deals with that. But could I tell you that the gospel is the answer for all of that? You see, what I need, what I need is I need healing from my past. I need help in my present. And I need hope for my future. And could I tell you that I have all three of those things in one thing? And that's called the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, I, uh, I have a lot of different memories in my mind when it comes to September 2001, to 9-11. Maybe you do. I, I, I can I remember where I was when I heard the news. I remember how I felt seeing planes dive in to the Twin Towers. I remember that. I remember watching news clips of all of that. But you know, there are two pictures that still stand in my mind. I can still see them today. There were two groups of people that day. And I'm not being critical of you, I'm just saying there were two groups of people that day that I saw in news clips. There were some people who were running away from the Twin Towers in an effort to save their lives. But there were some other people that day. And they weren't running away. They were running toward the ten Twin Towers. They were firefighters. They were first responders. They weren't running away from danger. They were running into danger in an effort to save lives. Hey, the church today is living in challenging times. 
And I'm telling you, it is. And we ought to be praying for a lot of things. And, and I'll, I'll meddle a little bit. I don't mind meddling as a preacher. Sometimes you need to meddle a little bit if it's gospel work. But this Equality Act, we ought, we ought to be reaching out to the people that we know that has any responsibility to vote for that. Because sooner or later in the church, it will come down to us. Whether you agree with that or not, it will come down to us. So we, 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 better, we, better, you know, we better reach out to that. And, and, and stand strong on where we the church are in the message that we have. But the question we need to ask, are, are we the ones running to this old world who's crumbling? It's crumbling, I'm telling you. What people believe today are beliefs that are not based on this right here. And I'm telling you, if, if, if they don't come right out of here, your life's going to crumble and crush to a fall. And we need to be running to that as the church. See, here's how I want to die. Here's how I want to die. I want to go out this way. I want to die unashamed and unafraid. I want to die unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to die unafraid to meet Jesus face to face. And do you know what gives me the ability to do that? The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Would you bow together with me for a moment of prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for today. And I thank you for this message that you've convicted my heart about as I was preparing it and praying over it this week. And Lord, I thank you for the group of people that have gathered this morning in this very service to worship and to study together the Word of God. And Lord, we thank you so much for the gospel, the good news of what Jesus Christ did for us. And I thank you, Lord, that you've reminded me that I have personal obligation to share that message. And that my sharing of it should come out of a passionate overflow because you've transformed my own life. And if I do that, the results will be a powerful outcome as you'll work mightily with your gospel in the lives of people with whom we share it. So Lord, help us to share the good news with family, with friends, with neighbors, with whomever we meet, wherever the territory you place us. Help us to be news people sharing your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our closing number, and that uh, number is uh, 259. If you want to turn to it there uh, in your Bibles, and Marjan's going to lead us in that. Would you stand together, please, as we sing this closing number 259.